Section 5 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 5 Isabella of Castile. She had all the royal makings of a queen. Shakespeare. Isabella of Spain, the Catholic, as she was called, stands before the world as a model of queenly and womanly excellence. In her, the energy of manhood, the wisdom of the statesman, the devout rectitude of a saint, and the tenderness and grace of woman, were more perfectly combined than in any female sovereign whose name adorns the pages of history. Far as the East is from the West, and distant as their several periods, is the character of this renowned Castilian from that of the passionate and cunning Cleopatra. The beautiful conscientiousness of the former, her firm adherence to conviction, her delicacy and mercy and sweet humility, are a proof of the moral superiority resulting from the prevalence of truth, however perverted or obscure it be, in the place of utter delusion, whatever of classic attraction it may have. Oblivion has veiled her faults, if any belong to her intrinsic being. She is left perfect to the eye of posterity, except it be in her almost inevitable failure to assert at all times her own manifest and better instincts over those influences in her life and time which go far to excuse the few blamable acts that may be charged upon her. And such a picture of character, fair as her own lovely countenance, is framed in the most picturesque era of modern history. The scenery and romantic associations of Spain, the conquest of the splendid Moorish kingdom of Granada, the gorgeous evening of the day of chivalry, and the morning of great discoveries heralded by Columbus, were the fit setting for the jewel of queens, or rather an appropriate scene for the display of her noble qualities. The disappointments she endured in the latter part of her life the cruelties of which she was the unwitting or unwilling a better, the bigotry that took advantage of her piety, and the despotism established by her husband, the artful Ferdinand, are the clouds that darken the narrative of a reign else bright and beautiful. Spain was originally divided into four kingdoms, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and the Moorish possessions, the latter comprising the most luxuriant districts and the most important strongholds upon the coast. Castile and Aragon were nearly alike, both governments being monarchical, yet in spirit republican. The king had little power, separate from the assembly or parliament, consisting of the grandees, nobles of the second class, representatives of towns and cities, and deputies of the clergy. This was evident in the oath of allegiance, taken in this form. We, who are each of us as good as you, and altogether more powerful than you, promise obedience to your government, if you maintain our rights and liberties, but not otherwise. Many of the nobles were in fact petty kings, owning vast and populous territories, which yielded them richer revenues and larger armies than the monarch himself could command. The continual jealousies and feuds existing among them kept the kingdom in constant turmoil, and thus originated the confusion, revolts, and successive tragedies that darkened the chronicles of Castile and Aragon, previous to the succession of Ferdinand and Isabella. While John II occupied the Castilian throne, his subjects laid aside for a time the ferocious and warlike spirit that had previously marked the national character and imitated the refined taste of their sovereign, whose love of letters and utter disinclination for business induced him to neglect even the most important affairs of the kingdom, leaving all in the hands of favorites, and often signing documents at their option, without taking the trouble to examine the contents. The nobles finally became disgusted with their poetizing king, and jealous of the arrogant favorites who, raised from an humble origin, assumed the dignity and magnificence of royalty, and presumed to direct the affairs of the kingdom. A revolt ensued, and Henry, the young son of the king, was placed at the head of the disaffected party. 
This storm was quelled at the accession of a new queen, a woman of strong and resolute character, who obtained such ascendancy over the ease-loving monarch as to cause the downfall and final execution of the principal and most obnoxious favorite, Alvaro de Luna. John's regret for this step induced a melancholy that aggravated the disease which terminated his life soon after. He left, by his first wife, one child, Henry, whom he appointed his successor and guardian of the two younger children by his second wife, Alfonso, then an infant, and Isabella, afterwards Queen of Castile, who was born April twenty second, 1451, at Madrigal. She was but four years old at the time of her father's death, and was soon after removed, with her mother, to the little town of Aravello. Henry the Fourth was welcomed to the throne amidst unfeigned expressions of joy from a people wearied with the long and glorious reign of his father. They hoped for a vigorous government, and the prosecution of the war against the Moors, which for years had been in contemplation. It required but a short time, however, to unfold the worthless character of the new king, who, without a corresponding taste for intellectual pursuits, inherited all his father's aversion to business. At once indolent, profligate, and imbecile, he gathered about him courtiers who, like himself, sought only frivolous or debasing amusements, till, without shame, they indulged in open vice, boldly boasting of their exploits. The low state of morals was not improved after the arrival of Joanna of Portugal, whom Henry espoused, having repudiated his first wife, Blanche of Aragon, after a union of twelve years. The new queen was accompanied by a brilliant suite, and her arrival was signalized by the festivities and pageant due to royalty in those days of chivalry. Being young, beautiful, and vivacious, she fascinated the Castilians, and by her wit and raillery, overcame the punctilious etiquette observed at court. Her freedom of manner soon gave rise to gross suspicions. Beltran de la Cueva, one of the handsomest and most accomplished cavaliers of his time, was designated her favorite, and notwithstanding her undisguised preference, the king, so far from resenting it, continued to heap favors upon the man, who previously had gained such ascendancy over him as to guide the affairs of the kingdom, to suit his own views and interests. To this polluted, licentious court, Isabella, in her sixteenth year, and her brother Alfonso, were brought after the birth of the ill-fated Princess Joanna. This was a matter of policy, as the king required the oath of allegiance to the infant Joanna as his successor, without regarding her supposed illegitimacy, and fearing the dissatisfied nobles would form a separate faction in favor of Isabella, he required her presence at the royal palace. All her early life had been spent in seclusion with her mother, who faithfully instructed her in those lessons of virtue and piety which shone out so vividly in after years. Her education received a finish seldom attained in that age. Her tastes were refined and elevated, her nature gentle and placid, and with these womanly qualities she united a maturity of judgment, energy, and firmness that fully fitted her for the commanding position she was soon to take. Her beauty, gentleness, and grace ensured her a warm welcome at court, but the satellites that invariably hastened to flutter about a new star and bask in its rays were soon overawed in her presence. The blameless purity of her conduct, her sincere, unostentatious piety, and natural dignity of demeanor repelled familiarity, while it won the truest affection and homage of those who surrounded her. She was one whose influence roused all the pure, noble, and true aspirations of the soul, and as such she stood alone in the royal family, and far above the contamination of its giddy train of followers. Being nearly related to the crown, her hand was sought from childhood by numerous applicants. While too young to have a voice in the decision, she was solicited for the same Ferdinand to whom she was destined to be finally united, and afterwards promised to his brother, Carlos, whose tragical end defeated the purpose. In her thirteenth year, Henry affianced her to Alfonso, king of Portugal. 
but after an interview with that monarch, neither entreaties nor threats could gain her consent to a union every way disagreeable to her. Knowing her refusal would avail her little, she replied with a discretion, rare at so early an age, that the Infantis of Castile could not be disposed of without the consent of the nobles of the realm. The chagrined monarch was obliged to withdraw his suit, and Isabella still continued free. Though Henry had not succeeded in disposing of her, he felt secure in having her under his surveillance, and in order to divert his discontented subjects, he announced a crusade against the Moors. He assumed the device of Granada, a pomegranate branch, in token of his intention to enroll it among his own provinces. And he assembled the chivalry of the nation, and with a splendid army set out for the Moorish dominions. This grand expedition ended only in an empty display beneath the walls of Granada, which were lined with jeering enemies, but with whom the timid king would not venture a battle, flying even from the petty scenes of action carried on along the borders, unless detained personally by the indignant knights, who burned to retaliate the insults of the infidels. But from all their expostulations and reproaches, the cowardly king took shelter in the reply that, he prized the life of one of his soldiers more than those of a thousand musclemen. Repeated attempts like these disgusted the gallant Castilians, and brought complaints from the southern provinces, which were laid waste in these continual affrays, and complained that the war was carried on against them instead of the infidels. Another cause of disquietude arose from the abuses of government, which occasioned almost a state of bankruptcy. The nobles, unable to obtain redress, converted their castles into fortresses, and with their retainers went out upon the highways, and robbing travelers and seizing upon their persons, sold them to the Moors, who retained them in slavery, except when redeemed by heavy ransoms. These occurrences received no check from the imbecile monarch. Such grievances, together with the jealousy of the nobility, in consequence of obscure persons being elevated above the old aristocracy of the kingdom, and some concessions made to Aragon which were thought to com compromise the honor of the nation, occasioned a general revolt. One of the prominent leaders of the insurgents was the Marquis of Elena, the most powerful noble in Castile, possessing a large and populous territory. He was a man of polished address and unfailing shrewdness, but turbulent, restless, and continually involving the nation in trouble. The other noted partisan was the Archbishop of Toledo, a stern warrior and churchman. A confederacy was organized which, among other things, demanded Alfonso to be recognized as Henry's successor, instead of Joanna. Too indolent to adopt severe measures to crush the rebellion in its beginning, he refused the advice of his adherents and yielded all that was demanded of him. He soon after retracted all his agreements, which so incensed and disgusted the Confederates that they determined to defy his authority and elect a king for themselves. An immense concourse assembled in an open plain near the city of Avila, where a scaffold was erected, and a crowned effigy of Henry the Fourth was placed upon a mock throne, arrayed in royal drapery, with a sword, scepter, and other insignia of royalty decorating it. A list of grievances was then read, after which the Marquis of Elena and other leaders despoiled the statue of its kingly trappings and threw it to the ground, where it was rolled and trampled in the dust by the excited multitude. Alfonso, then but eleven years of age, was seated in the chair of state, proclaimed king, and received the homage of the multitude amidst a loud flourish of trumpets. The news of this bold usurpation threw the whole kingdom into a frightful state of excitement, since every man was obliged to choose his party. Old feuds were revived, families divided one against another, and all the horrors of a civil war threatened to devastate the land. Henry was obliged to summon his forces, which were strong enough to have maintained his right to the throne. But they had no sooner assembled than he disbanded them, and commenced negotiations with the cunning Marquis. A cessation of hostilities during six months was agreed upon in order to make some amicable arrangement. But Henry's adherents were overwhelmed with indignation that he should have forsaken his own cause. Had a humane spirit dictated his course, he might have been honored. 
but the weakness and cowardice plainly evinced in all his movements made him despicable in the eyes of his subjects and the jest of his enemies in an age when the laws of chivalry demanded redress for the slightest affront the two parties maintained their separate sovereigns with their respective courts each enacting laws as if the other was not in existence it was plainly seen that peace could not be long preserved while they were thus playing at cross purposes but the ready marquis of elena devised a scheme which should conciliate all parties and secure his own aggrandizement he proposed the marriage of his brother don pedro de pacheco grand master of calatrava a prominent member of the new party with isabella to this the feeble king assented though the project was strongly opposed by isabella who considered it not only degrading to her rank but bore a personal dislike to pacheco he was many years her senior of dissolute habits was a fierce and noisy leader of faction and in every respect unfitted to appreciate isabella's lofty character her opposition availed her nothing however and not knowing whither to turn for escape from the hateful marriage she shut herself in her own apartments praying and fasting for a day and night when weeping under the tyranny her heartless brother imposed and bewailing her fate to a faithful courageous friend beatrix de Bodadilla, the latter exclaimed god will not permit it neither will i and drawing forth a gleaming dagger she wore concealed upon her person passionately vowed to strike don pedro to the heart if he dared to drag her to the altar magnificent preparations went on for the celebration of the nuptials the master of calatrava had obtained a dispensation from the pope releasing him from the vows of celibacy and exultingly devised the most extravagant display for an occasion which was to bestow upon his fortunate self the hand of a beautiful and distinguished princess nearly related to the crown already he saw himself a king elated with the prospect and quite insensible to the unwillingness of the bride-elect he set out from his residence with an imposing and showy retinue for madrid where the ceremony was to be performed on his way thither however he was seized with a fatal illness and died with frightful imprecations on his lips because his life had not been spared till the goal of his ambition had been reached his death was by some attributed to poison though no one cast the slightest imputation on isabella whose well-known purity and uprightness placed her above suspicion don pedro's death dissipated all the fine schemes for the reconciliation of the parties and it was soon determined to decide the contest by a battle the two armies met at olmedo the royal adherents greatly outnumbered the confederates but the latter made up in enthusiasm and spirit what they lacked in numbers alfonso's army was led by the archbishop of toledo conspicuously arrayed in a scarlet mantle embroidered with a white cross beneath which he wore a complete suit of armor the prince also clad in mail rode at his side before the battle commenced the archbishop sent a message to beltran de la cueva advising him not to appear in the field as a score of knights had vowed his death he returned a defiant answer minutely describing the dress he was to wear on the occasion which cost him many a sharp struggle during the day henry took great care to avoid a dangerous proximity to the scene of blood and death and upon the first announcement of the enemy's victory which proved to be a false alarm he fled in dismay with forty attendants to a near village for safety leaving his friends to fight as best they might the battle ceased only when darkness separated the combatants nothing being gained on either side the insurgents however occupied the city of segovia where isabella repaired after the battle and during the succeeding months of anarchy and bloodshed remained under alfonso's protection the struggle ceased at the death of alfonso who after a short and sudden illness expired the fifth of july fourteen sixty eight at a little village near avila the scene of his proclaimed sovereignty two years before his loss was deeply deplored as he gave promise of unusual talent and possessed a nobleness of sentiment that might have made him a just and great king his death was ascribed by many to poison and by others to the plague which united its unsparing scythe to the chariot of war that wheeled right and left over fair castile 
Isabella immediately retired to a monastery at Avila, but the alarmed confederacy looked to her at it as its head, and unanimously delegated the Archbishop of Toledo to offer her the crown of Castile and Leon, promising her their support. Notwithstanding the primate's eloquent entreaties, she firmly refused the honor, replying magnanimously that, while her brother Henry lived, none other had a right to the crown, that the country had been divided long enough under the rule of two contending monarchs, and that the death of Alfonso might perhaps be interpreted into an indication from heaven of its disapprobation of their cause. The inhabitants of Seville and other cities proclaimed her their queen, and continued to send deputies to gain her consent to adopt their cause. But her immovable decision obliged the Confederates to open negotiations with the ruling sovereign, which ended in, an, in a treaty, many of the articles whereof were degrading to him as a man and as a king. He declared Joanna illegitimate, and accepted Isabella as his heir and successor. An interview took place between Henry and Isabella at Toros de Guisando, each accompanied by a brilliant suite. When the king affectionately embraced his sister and publicly announced her as successor to the throne. This was followed by an oath of allegiance from the assembled grandees who, in token of their faithfulness, knelt and kissed the hand of the princess. Isabella took up her residence at Ocana, where she enjoyed comparative quiet in the peace and prosperity once more restored to the distracted kingdom. Suitors appeared with redoubled assiduity now that her succession to the throne was established. Among them was a brother of Edward the Fourth of England and the Duke of Guillaume, brother of the French king and heir apparent to the throne. Isabella's choice hesitated between the latter and Ferdinand of Aragon, though her decision was influenced by a personal preference as well as by the interests of the kingdom. France was distant from Castile, and the customs, language, and manners of the people widely differed, while Aragon was closely allied to Castile in every respect. Aside from this, Ferdinand greatly exceeded the duke in personal appearance and accomplishments, which enlisted Isabella's favor. In this decision she was fiercely opposed by a party who had retired in disgust at Henry's repudiation of Joanna and headed by the malicious Marquis of Elena, formed a new faction in favor of the discarded heir. In Isabella's marriage with Ferdinand, the Marquis saw his own downfall, and, with the hope of frustrating her intentions, regained his power over her guardian, the king, and it induced him to suggest to Alfonso of Portugal the renewal of his former addresses more publicly. End of section 5section 6 of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine h the heroines of history by john s jenkins section 6 isabella of castile part 2 the king of portugal gladly acceded and sent a pompous and magnificent embassy to Isabella at Ocana. She peremptorily declined the honor, which so incensed Henry that, urged on by the cunning Marquis, he threatened her with imprisonment in the royal fortress at Madrid, if she did not see fit to acquiesce in the choice he had made for her. Such menaces did not intimidate her, as the inhabitants of Ocana were devotedly attached to her, and approved of the Aragonese match making known their approbation by singing ballads in the streets that derided Alfonso and compared his age and defects to Ferdinand's youth, beauty, and chivalry. She also had the promised support of the Archbishop of Toledo, who was warmly attached to her interests, offering to come in person at the head of a sufficient force to protect her if violent measures were resorted to. Notwithstanding a provision in the treaty which required her to consult Henry as to her marriage, she determined no longer to regard his wishes, since he had violated almost every article himself. Without farther hesitation, she took the opportunity of his absence in the southern provinces to quell an insurrection, 
to send an envoy to Aragon, accepting Ferdinand's suit. While awaiting the result, she repaired to Madrigal, remaining with her mother for greater security. This proved a disadvantage, as she found there the Bishop of Burgos, a nephew of the Marquis of Elena, who acted as a spy upon all her movements, corrupted her servants, ferreted out her designs, and faithfully reported the particulars to Henry and the Marquis. They became alarmed at her daring step, and at once made preparations to put their threat in execution. By an order from the king, the Archbishop of Seville was directed to proceed to Madrigal with a sufficient force to secure Isabella, and the inhabitants were warned not to attempt her defense. They entreated her to fly, and succeeded in informing the Archbishop of Toledo of her danger. He promptly placed himself at the head of a body of horse, proceeded to Madrigal with such speed as to arrive before her enemies, and gallantly carried her off in the very face of the Bishop of Burgos and his guard. She was thus escorted to the city of Valladolid, where the inhabitants greeted her with hearty enthusiasm. Soon after her arrival, a dispatch was sent to Ferdinand to expedite matters during the king's absence. John of Aragon had received the favorable answer to his son's suit with the greatest satisfaction, as it had long been his favorite scheme to consolidate the provinces of Spain under one head. The marriage articles had been signed, the most pleasing of which to the Castilians was that Ferdinand should reside in Castile, and the essential rights of sovereignty over that kingdom should be relinquished to his consort. But the arrival of the princess's messengers, with the information of the necessity of hasty measures, embarrassed the king of Aragon, whose treasury was exhausted by a war with the Catalans, leaving him without means to provide Ferdinand with a suitable escort, or to support the expense attending a royal marriage. After much deliberation, it was decided that the prince should go, in the disguise of a servant, to a pretended company of merchants, while, to divert the attention of the Castilians, a showy embassy should proceed by another route. This stratagem succeeded. The distance to be traversed was short, but the country was patrolled by troops to intercept them, and the frontiers were guarded by strong fortified castles. They traveled at night, Ferdinand performing all the offices of a servant, till they reached the friendly castle of the Count of Trevino, from which a well-armed escort accompanied them to Duenas in Leon. Here he was welcomed by a throng of nobles, and the joyful intelligence of his safe arrival sent to Isabella. The following evening, he went secretly to Valladolid, accompanied by a few persons. He was warmly received by the Archbishop of Toledo, who conducted him to the princess at the palace of John Ververa, where she, with her little court, resided. Ferdinand was at this time in his eighteenth year. His complexion was fair, though somewhat bronzed by constant exposure to the sun. His eyes quick and cheerful, his forehead ample and approaching to baldness, his muscular and well-proportioned frame was invigorated by the toils of war and by the chivalrous exercises in which he delighted. He was one of the best horsemen in his court and excelled in field sports of every kind. His voice was somewhat sharp, but he possessed a fluent eloquence, and when he had a point to carry, his address was courteous and insinuating. Isabella was a year older than he. She was well-formed, of the middle size, with great dignity and gracefulness of deportment, a mingled gravity and sweetness of demeanor, confiding and affectionate. Her complexion was fair, her hair auburn, inclining to redness, her eyes of a clear blue with a benign expression, and there was a singular modesty in her countenance, gracing as it did a wonderful firmness of purpose and earnestness of spirit. The interview lasted two hours, full of interest and mutual admiration, sealing the marriage contract with a love that rarely unites royal hearts, denied the free choice that blesses lower rank. Arrangements were made for the celebration of the nuptials, but both parties were so poor as to be obliged to borrow money to defray the expenses of the occasion. The ceremony took place on the morning of October 19, 1469, at the palace, and in the presence of a large assemblage of noblemen and dignitaries. A week of festive rejoicings followed, and, at its expiration, the newly married pair publicly attended Mass at one of the churches, as was the custom. 
their first step had been to inform the king of their union and loyal submission he coldly received their tardy seeking of his approbation and replied that he should consult his ministers the marquis of elena who had now attained the dignity of grand master of st james chagrined at the failure of his schemes quickly concocted new ones that put all castile in ferment he counseled henry to again institute joanna his successor which advice was the more readily accepted since an embassy had just arrived from the king of france proposing the duke of gouin isabella's disappointed suitor for his daughter's hand an interview took place between the castilian monarch and the french ambassadors during which a proclamation was read condemning isabella's violation of the treaty by her unapproved marriage and reinstating joanna in her former rights the nobles took the oath of allegiance and the young princess was formally affianced to the duke of gouin ferdinand and his consort now almost forsaken by the same ones who a short time before had warmly espoused their cause remained quietly at duenas surrounded by an unostentatious court and so poor they could scarcely support the expenses of their frugal table henry's court on the contrary exhibited a frivolous and corrupt abandonment himself the spectacle of a king completely under the guidance of rapacious and profligate counsellors and his dominion the scene of continued warfare and crime carried on with impunity under the very eyes of castile's incapable monarch at this crisis and when ferdinand's presence was most needed to inspire the remaining adherents with courage he was summoned to the assistance of his father who at war with france was perilously besieged in the city of perpignan with isabella's approbation ferdinand led a body of horse furnished by the archbishop of toledo into aragon where he received reinforcements from the nobility of that kingdom with this army he suddenly appeared before the surprised enemy who abandoned the siege in dismay john with the remnant of his troops went out to meet his son and deliverer whom he embraced with affecting gratitude in the presence of the two armies during this absence several events favored isabella's fortune the archbishop of seville a powerful man in position and character observed the marked contrast between the courts of the king and princess and won by the superior decorum of the latter justly concluded castile would attain a greater degree of prosperity under her firm administration than it could ever reach in the reign of her weak-minded rival who like her father was entirely controlled by those around him influenced by such considerations the archbishop revolutionized his interest and fortune in isabella's favor another important accession to her party was one of the king's officers andres de cabrera who controlled the royal coffers partly influenced by hatred toward the grand master of st james and more by the urgent importunities of his wife beatrix de bodedilla isabella's early friend he opened a secret correspondence with the princess advising her to have an interview with her brother to assure her of his friendly motives he sent his wife who performed the journey in the disguise of a peasant and thus unsuspected reached duenas gained access to the apartments of her royal friend and induced her to attempt a reconciliation with the king with this certainty of protection from cabrera and his friends isabella willingly set out for saragossa where henry usually resided an interview took place that resulted in a good understanding and to give public proof of it the king led her palfrey through the streets of the city grand fetes were given to express the universal joy at the event while these rejoicings were in progress ferdinand returned to castile and hastened to saragossa where he was warmly welcomed by his sovereign this happy reconciliation did not suit the designs of the plotting favorite who took the first occasion to crush these germs of peace after a splendid entertainment given by cabrera henry was taken violently ill ever ready to listen to his crafty minister's suggestions he attributed to poison the result of his own excesses and immediately issued secret orders for isabella's arrest the vigilance of her friends saved her and she returned to duenas in disgust ferdinand was again called to his father's succor in the meantime events thickened toward the consummation of his consort's power the death of the duke of gouin in france dampened the hopes of the opposing party for joanna 
more especially since the alliance had been declined by several princes, owing to her alleged illegitimacy. Shortly after, Henry was deprived of his supporter and adviser by the death of the Grand Master of St. James. This was an occasion of more joy than grief to the Castilians, who were now delivered from the cause of nearly all the evils that for years had banished peace from the kingdom. To the monarch it was an irreparable loss, occasioning an anxiety and melancholy that hastened the progress of a disease which, for some time, had threatened his life. Undecided in matters of moment to the last, he died December 11th, 1474, unlamented, without a will, and without naming his successor. The following morning Isabella, who was at Segovia, desired the inhabitants of that city to proclaim her sovereignty, resting her claims to the crown upon the fact that the Cortes had never revoked the act which appointed her Henry's successor, although twice summoned by him to give allegiance to Joanna. An assemblage of the chief grandees, nobles, and dignitaries, in robes of office, gathered at the castle, and, receiving Isabella under a canopy of rich brocade, conducted her to the public square. Two of the chief citizens led the Spanish Jeanette she rode, preceded by an officer on horseback, who upheld a naked sword, the symbol of sovereignty. A platform had been erected and a throne placed upon it, which Isabella occupied with graceful dignity, while a herald proclaimed, Castile, Castile, for the King Don Ferdinand and his consort Doña Isabella, Queen Proprietor of these kingdoms. The royal standard was then unfurled, and the peal of bells and sound of cannon announced the recognizance of the new queen. The procession then moved to the principal cathedral, where, after the solemn chanting of the Te Deum, Isabella devoutly prostrated herself before the altar and invoked the protection and guidance of the Almighty. Immediately after the coronation, deputies from various cities tendered their allegiance and raised the new standard upon their walls. Ferdinand was still absent, but on his return he exhibited great dissatisfaction with the investment of supreme authority in his consort. With unyielding firmness and winning gentleness, she maintained her right, convincing and at the same time, with womanly tact, soothing her offended husband, by mild, just reasoning, assuring him their interests were indivisible, that the division of power was but nominal, and that the interest of their only child, a daughter, demanded it, as she could not inherit the crown if females were excluded from the succession. This was one of his grounds of contention, since he himself was a distant heir of the Castilian crown. It was satisfactorily decided, however, that all appointments were to be made in the name of both, with the advice and consent of the queen. The commanders of fortified places were to render homage to her alone. Justice was to be administered by both conjointly when residing in the same place, and independently when separate. Proclamations and letters patent were to be subscribed with the signatures of both. Their images were to be stamped on the public coin and the united arms of Castile and Aragon emblazoned on a common seal. The succession was not yet peacefully established. Joanna's party still contended for the crown. Among her prominent supporters was the young Marquis of Valena, who inherited his father's titles and estates, but not his crafty, intriguing character. The Archbishop of Toledo, offended with the proclaimed queen because he was not solely consulted by her, and jealous of the rising importance of Cardinal Mendoza, suddenly withdrew from court. He shortly after openly espoused the cause of the unfortunate princess whom he had so long and successfully opposed. He would not be conciliated by any advances from Ferdinand and Isabella, who, as far as possible, without compromising their dignity, sought to regain his friendship. Propositions were now made by the rebellious party to Alfonso V of Portugal, to espouse Joanna and assist in asserting her claims. To this he readily agreed. He assembled an army which comprised the flower of the Portuguese nobility, eager to engage in an expedition that promised them glory in the chivalrous defense of an injured princess. Advancing into Castile, they were met by the Duke of Aravello and the Marquis of Valena, who presented the king to his future bride. 
they were publicly affianced and proclaimed king and queen of Castile. A week of festivities followed, after which the army quietly awaited reinforcements from the Castilians. During this delay, Ferdinand and Isabella, who, on the first arrival of the invaders, possessed but a scanty army, put forth indefatigable exertions to strengthen their forces. Isabella frequently sat up the whole night dictating dispatches. She visited in person, on horseback, the several cities that had delayed allegiance, thus succeeding in rallying an army of 42,000 men well equipped. On one of her journeys, she sent a message to the archbishop, notifying him of an intended visit in hope of reconciliation, to which he impudently replied that, if the queen entered by one door, he would go out at the other. As soon as such preparations as could be rapidly made were completed, the army set out for the city of Toro, of which Alfonso had taken possession. Unable to engage the Portuguese in battle, Ferdinand laid siege to the city, but owing to a want of proper battering artillery and the cutting off of supplies by the enemy, who occupied the neighboring fortresses, he was obliged to withdraw his forces. An inglorious and confused retreat followed. The army was disbanded, scattering to their homes or strengthening the garrisons of friendly cities. The Archbishop of Toledo exulted at this ominous opening of the war on the part of the king, and no longer hesitated to join the enemy with all the forces under his command, haughtily boasting that he had raised Isabella from the distaff and would soon send her back to it again. Tidings from Portugal of an invasion caused the detachment of so large a portion of Alfonso's army as to cripple his operations, obliging him to remain in Toro without any aggressive movements. The king and queen, in the meantime, gathered a new army and proceeded to besiege Zamora. That being an important post to the enemy, Alfonso abandoned Toro, and with reinforcements from Portugal, headed by his son, Prince John, went to its relief. A battle ensued in which the Portuguese were completely routed and would have been nearly all put to the sword but for the friendly darkness that enabled many in extremity to give the Castilian war cry of St. James and St. Lazarus and thus escape their confused pursuers. Many of the troops were massacred in attempting to fly to the frontiers of their own country. This cruelty was rebuked by Ferdinand, who not only ordered their safe conduct, but provided many of them with clothing, who were brought prisoners in a state of destitution and suffering. He permitted them to return safely to their homes. Isabella, upon hearing of this decisive victory, commanded the people to go in procession to the church of St. Paul, humbly walking barefoot herself to the cathedral, where thanksgiving was offered to God for the success he had vouchsafed them. Complete submission followed, except from the Marquis of Valena and the imperious archbishop, who maintained their rebellious maneuvers till the demolition of their castles and the desertion of their retainers obliged them to yield. Alfonso retreated into Portugal with Joanna, but, mortified with his defeat, applied to the King of France to assist him in securing the crown of Castile for the Princess Joanna. He remained nearly a year in France for that purpose. Louis promised assistance when Alfonso's title was secured by a dispensation from the Pope for his marriage with Joanna. To his entire chagrin, he found that Louis was already negotiating with his rivals, and, overwhelmed with mortification at having been duped before all the world, he retired to an obscure village in Normandy, and wrote Prince John of his wish to resign his crown and enter a monastery. His retreat was discovered, and at last, persuaded by the urgent entreaties of his followers, he returned to Portugal, arriving just after his son's coronation. This caused him additional chagrin. John, however, immediately resigned his premature dignity on his father's reappearance. A treaty was soon after confirmed with Castile, which obliged Alfonso to resign all claims to the hand of Joanna, and imposed upon her the necessity of taking the veil or wedding Don Juan, the infant son of Ferdinand and Isabella, when he should arrive at a suitable age. Wearied and disgusted with worldly ambition, forsaken by her relatives, successively affianced to princes who, one after another, rejected her at every reverse of fortune, and at last offered a consort still in the cradle, with the alternative of becoming a nun, she chose the latter, 
as at least a means of releasing her from a position which made her the football of opposing parties. End of section 6「Section 7 of The Heroines of History」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 7 Isabella of Castile Part 3 Alfonso was so much disappointed at the loss of his bride that he determined to put his former threat of entering a monastery in execution. The one he fixed upon was situated in a lonely spot on the shores of the Atlantic, but the realization of this Quixotic fancy was prevented by his death shortly after Joanna took the veil. The same year, 1479, chronicled the death of John of Aragon, thus bequeathing an independent crown to Ferdinand. This event strengthened the security of Castile and cemented the various provinces into a whole that was soon to stand foremost among nations. When tranquility was at last restored to a people who for years had suffered the disasters of war, one would suppose they would willingly have been cradled in the arms of peace and prosperity. But the restless, turbulent spirit of the times required a channel for its resistless flood that would otherwise undermine the foundations of a throne slowly gaining steadiness and solidity after its long rocking. The ambition of the chivalry of Spain was enthusiastically directed towards the prosecution of the war against the Moors, while the zealous clergy were absorbed in the new project of establishing the Inquisition in these dominions, rapidly becoming more powerful. The Jews, who were a numerous, wealthy, and important class, had incurred the hatred of the Castilians both on account of their heretical belief and because of the almost irretrievable indebtedness of a large share of the nobility to these moneylenders. Since the avowed purpose of the Inquisition was the conversion or condemnation of this unfortunate people, both the Castilians and Aragonese submitted to its otherwise detested establishment, hoping thus to escape their extensive liabilities, not foreseeing that its unlimited power might finally initiate the whole nation in its mysterious horrors. The clergy were eager for the work, and the Pope willingly sanctioned measures which, by the confiscation of the estates of the accused, would pour immense wealth into his coffers. Isabella, whose tenderness of heart revolted at the barbarous design, withheld her consent till, blinded by the united representations of advisers in whom she reposed confidence, and actuated by a bigotry which owed its place in her otherwise perfect character to the early teachings of her confessor, Thomas de Torquemada, a proud, intolerant man of unrelenting cruelty, she at length permitted the appointment of two Dominican friars in September 1480, who were ordered to repair to Seville and commence operations immediately. This appointment was not made, however, till after Isabella had induced them to employ milder means that failed, of course, in the hands of fiery, overbearing monks. An edict was issued ordering the arrest of all persons suspected of heresy, some of the proofs of which were wearing cleaner linen on the Jewish Sabbath than on other days of the week, having no fire in the house the preceding evening, giving Hebrew names to children, a whimsical, cruel provision, since, by an enactment of Henry the Second, they were prohibited the use of Christian names under severe penalties. The cells of the convent of St. Paul, where the dreadful tribunal commenced its murderous deeds, were quickly filled, and the number of arrests multiplied so rapidly that they were obliged to remove its operations to the fortress of Triana, in the suburbs of Seville. Removed from the immediate supervision of the citizens, the infatuated, brutal monks carried on the revolting work, instituting mock trials which gave the accused no opportunity of defense, but confronted him with witnesses concealed beneath black cowls and judges enveloped in dark robes. 
the scene was rendered more gloomy and depressing by the dimly lighted chambers where the sittings were held the victim with no hope of escape however innocent was often condemned through the machinations of some deadly but disguised enemy hurried away and subjected to most excruciating tortures in dungeons too deep for their cries of agony to reach any sympathizing ear in the meantime isabella who devoutly believed this to be a pious work was occupied in preparations for the moorish war in accordance with the promise she made on ascending the throne and with the same bigoted zeal that actuated her in the forced conversion of her own subjects ferdinand engaged in the project with commendable activity under the cloak of his most catholic majesty but with the secret gratification of adding to his dominions a wealthy and beautiful region acknowledged as the eden of spain its position too embracing the most important fortifications along the coast caught the covetous eye of the king and probably had an influence upon isabella though her prominent idea was the conversion of the infidels the moorish kingdoms which had formerly extended over a large portion of spain had been reduced by successive conquerors to a narrow district of seventy miles in breadth lying between the mountains and sea and stretching along the coast one hundred and eighty miles the inhabitants were still subject to their enemies being obliged to pay an annual tribute which had ceased during the reign of henry the second and his successors in this interval they had become prosperous amassed great wealth beautified their possessions with every known luxury and cultivated the arts and sciences to a surprising degree ingenious and inventive they originated much that has been universally adopted by mankind to them we owe the first manufacture of paper and from them came the equally world appropriated invention of gunpowder astronomy philosophy and mathematics made rapid strides under their direction though perverted to the uses of astrology magic and the untiring search after the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone literature and poetry were successfully cultivated but overburdened with legends and fairy tales that have since been inwoven in the poetry of all nations the renowned city of granada was situated nearly in the center of the kingdom upon two hills and an intervening valley one of the hills being crowned by the fortress of alcazaba the other by the palace of alhambra magnificent and fanciful in its architecture adorned within by richly tinted walls musical fountains perfumed gardens and gay with gorgeously dressed attendants now a pile of ruins whose history seems but the magical creation of an arabian romance noble palaces and lofty houses abounding in oriental colonnades and graceful porticos crowded the city it was famous for its gallant warriors who proudly boasted an army of twenty thousand men within its walls around the city extended the vega or plain of granada luxurious with vineyards abundant in citron and orange groves that perpetually blossomed and watered by the senil that flowed in a thousand diverted channels through these enchanting gardens upon one side of the plain extended a long range of mountains whose snowy peaks rose like sentinels along the frontiers while the dark mediterranean dashed against the rocky battlements with which nature had provided its extreme southern boundary populous cities towns and impregnable fortresses were numerous in this fertile kingdom which was regarded by the moors with a passionate devotion revealed in the romantic ballads and legends that immortalized its beauty and glory the king muli abin hassan was an old man yet one who retained the fiery spirit of his youth and the natural vigor of his mind he still held the reins of government with a firm unyielding hand but was an undisputed tyrant in his domestic relations to this haughty monarch ferdinand and isabella sent an embassy as soon as their purpose was decided demanding the payment of long arrears of tribute due to castile he received the embassy in the halls of the alhambra and proudly defied the demand tell your sovereigns said he that the kings of granada 
who used to pay tribute to the Castilian crown, are dead. Our mint at present coins nothing but blades of scimitars and heads of lances. The indignant ambassadors returned to Castile, while Aben Hassan, fully aware of the vast preparations making against him, determined to open hostilities himself. The fortress and town of Zahara, negligently guarded because of its impregnable situation upon craggy heights, was fixed upon for the first onset. An inconsiderable number of valiant Moors scaled the almost inaccessible walls of precipitous rock, and under cover of a raging tempest and the darkness of night, surprised the slumbering inhabitants, massacring such as resisted and carrying the rest into slavery. The news of this capture roused the wrath and revenge of all Spain, as though it had not intended to commit a like aggression. Ponce de Leon, the Marquis of Cadiz, noted for his personal prowess, was selected to conduct an army of five thousand foot and horse into the enemy's country, though with some especial design his soldiers were kept in ignorance, they expecting some sally along the frontiers. They performed a fatiguing and perilous march over the mountains that separated them from the kingdom of Granada, the way being rendered more dangerous by moving only at night in order to conceal their approach. This feat accomplished, the Marquis announced to his astonished soldiers that they were within half a league of the fortress of Alama, in the very heart of the Moorish dominions. This fortress and town, of the same name, were, like Sahara, situated on a rocky eminence, washed at its base by a deep river on one side, and screened on the other side from any powerful attack by the mountains. Its apparent security of position lulled the vigilance of the sentinels, and enabled a detachment of the Spanish army to scale the walls unseen, put the garrison to the sword, and throw open the gates to the remaining troops. The town was captured after a brave resistance from the Moors, who fought desperately this first battle for their beautiful land, their homes, and those endeared ones who were threatened with death or hopeless slavery. The news of this daring exploit, almost within sight of Granada, struck terror into the hearts of the people, who deplored the evil the tyrant king was bringing upon them. The astrologers shook their heads, and said the stars denoted the downfall of the empire, while the poets mournfully sang, Woe is Alhama, and women and children rushed through the streets, tearing their hair, and wildly calling upon their king to stay the destruction which threatened to overwhelm them. But Aben Hassan, roused by this defiance of the Castilians thrown in his very teeth, and deaf to the lamentations and reproaches of his subjects, made hasty preparations to retake his captured city. A large army, fierce for vengeance, assembled under the walls of Alhama, and laid siege to the city. The conquerors held unflinchingly what they had so perilously grasped, unintimidated by the fast exhausting means found in the city, or the long protracted, fierce attacks of the Moors, rapidly thinning their numbers. In this extremity, the Marquis succeeded in conveying intelligence to his wife, who, alarmed for the safety of her husband, quickly dispatched a message to the most powerful neighboring chief, the Duke of Sidonia, to fly to his relief. This nobleman was a deadly enemy of the Marquis, but with chivalrous honor obeyed the confiding frankness of the demand, and with his speedily gathered retainers, amounting to fifty-five thousand, set out for the Moorish dominions. The tidings of the victory and ensuing danger of the Spanish army at Alama reached Ferdinand and Isabella at Medina del Campo. After a public procession and thanksgiving in the cathedrals, Ferdinand dispatched orders to the duke, who had already begun his march, to await his presence. But he, unwilling to lose a moment, disobeyed the command and pushed on to the rescue of his countrymen. The first announcement of their approach to Alama was the sudden retreat of the Moors into Granada, a movement the besieged could not comprehend till, presently, they saw lances glittering and banners floating among the defiles of the mountains. 
with shouts of joy they went forth to meet the brilliant array the marquis and duke embracing cordially in presence of both armies forever burying the animosity that had stained their family escutcheons with the blood of many generations they triumphantly entered the city together in accordance with isabella's directions the cross was reared where the crescent had hung for centuries the mosques were converted into cathedrals and the belongings and decorations of catholic worship displaced the sacred utensils of moorish rites an exquisitely embroidered cloth the work of the queen's own hands was laid upon the newly erected altar in the principal mosque of alama thus consecrating to religion what had been gained by rapacious bloodshed a stronghold now being secured in the very midst of the kingdom of granada isabella determined to prosecute the war more vigorously than ever with her sanction ferdinand summoned an army which it was found lacked sufficient supplies of ordnance and ammunition in consequence of want of means to incur further expense not listening to the advice of more experienced men and burning with a desire for military renown he persisted in entering upon a campaign with this ill-equipped army the soldiers caught the dispirited bearing of the leaders and full of evil forebodings dejectedly followed the royal standard carried before them to the cathedral of cordova to receive a blessing and thence on their long march and toil over the rugged mountains laxa a thriving city on the banks of the senil so completely surrounded by inaccessible rocks as to be designated a flower among thorns was the first point of attack the army fatigued with their rough march and with no ardor in the enterprise poorly withstood the wily assaults of the moors who practicing the arabian and indian tactics concealed themselves in crevices or behind rocks and suddenly sprang upon their astonished foes darted fatal showers of poisoned arrows among their ranks then fell upon them with never failing scimitars and deadly knives a complete rout ensued and the remnant of ferdinand's army returned to cordova in a disconsolate plight isabella was mortified at such a signal defeat she fully resolved to adopt measures proportioned to the importance of the undertaking and not thus allow the fame of castilian arms to be tarnished the court removed to madrid at the beginning of the year fourteen eighty three a year remarkable for the death of the archbishop of toledo who after his disgrace retired to his own palace where he pursued the study of alchemy with such infatuation as exhausted even his princely revenues this year was also notable for the appointment of thomas de torquemada inquisitor general of castile and aragon investing him with full powers to conduct the operations of the holy office powers which he exercised with the utmost vigor and cruelty enforcing every imaginable torture with horrible precision isabella permitted its continuance notwithstanding the serious drain it produced upon the working classes as well as the nobility no one was above a suspicion that without warning he might be snatched away from the fireside from the busy loom or the plying hammer with a suddenness and impenetrable secrecy that seemed the work of imps of satan carrying their victims to subterranean halls and placing them before malicious cowled tribunals which consigned them to a frightful secret death in the depths of the fortresses and castles occupied by the inquisitors had isabella been left to her own judgment she would have used milder means to root out heresy from her kingdom but actuated by her early teachers who impressed her with the duty of thorough action and influenced by her confessor talavera she countenanced the proceedings of the inquisition talavera though not possessing the cruelty of torquemada was equally austere and haughty upon his first attendance upon the queen as confessor he remained seated while she knelt before him it is usual for both parties to kneel said she no replied he this is god's tribunal i act here as his minister and it is fitting that i should keep my seat 
while your highness kneels before me. This is the confessor I wanted, she said afterwards in commenting upon it. What wonder that with such spiritual guides, in whom she reposed the greatest confidence, her doubts should be overruled. Her resolution to execute the war of Granada on a larger scale was soon made manifest. In opposition to the wishes of Ferdinand and the chief leaders, she used energetic measures to raise a new army. Ashamed to be outdone by a woman, the old spirit of chivalry was roused again, and they now eagerly offered their services to the courageous queen. The treasury being exhausted by the various objects that drew largely upon it, the Pope was applied to, who permitted funds to be raised out of the ecclesiastical revenue, and also issued a Bull of Crusade, which granted indulgences to all who should take up arms against the infidel. Magnificent preparations were made with expectations of a certain success that seemed to be warranted by the scenes of civil faction which Granada presented. The Sultana Aixa was jealous of a beautiful Greek slave, of whom the old king was undisguisedly fond, and fearing lest the succession of her own son, Boabdil, should be superseded by other heirs, she represented her wrongs to the people, already rebellious under the tyrannical government. These intrigues were discovered, for which Aben Hassan caused her to be imprisoned in the highest tower of the Alhambra. With the aid of her attendants, she effected the escape of herself and son by tying scarves and shawls together, upon which doubtful support they descended to the ground unharmed, and were welcomed by a large share of the quickly assembled inhabitants. A contest soon commenced, which stained the halls of the Alhambra with blood, and drove from it the tyrant king, who took shelter in Malaga, a city that remained loyal to him, leaving Boabdil to occupy the throne. While the kingdom of Granada was thus weakened by domestic feuds, and unable to rally unitedly, the Castilians decided to strike a blow at Malaga. The gallant army passed out of the gates of Antiquera, exultant and eager for the victory of which they were confident. The following day they arrived at the tortuous defiles of the Axarquia, dragging heavy artillery and baggage through the rocky windings with great difficulty. During the slow ascent, the inhabitants of the villages among the mountains had time to escape with their effects and spread the alarm through the lower country. End of Section 7 8 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 8. Isabella of Castile. Part 4. Aben Hassan made immediate preparations, and with a strong force sallied from the city of Malaga to meet the enemy while entangled in the passes. The Castilians were under several leaders, neither of whom had the supreme command. Not finding the booty they anticipated, they began to separate in various detachments, that of the Grand Master of St. James alone proceeding in military order. Upon that division the first attack of the Moors fell, and as soon as the sound of the alarm was given, the Marquis of Cadiz hastened to his relief. The spirit and agility of the Moors gave them success. The Castilians were scattered, and, laden with spoils gathered in the various forages for which they had separated, and unable to manage the cavalry amid the defiles, were driven back after a desperate struggle. In order to facilitate their escape, they were obliged to leave the artillery, baggage, and dearly earned booty to their pursuers. Their retreat was further embarrassed by missiles showered upon them from the heights above by the numerous peasantry and villagers. Heavy rocks and stones rolled down upon their close ranks, making fearful inroads on the already diminished numbers, causing confusion, alarm, and a struggle for life that lessened the chances of escape and often sent them rolling into deep chasms, clutching each other with a death-grasp. 
the marquis of cadiz succeeded in extricating his detachment and escaped to andalusia but the rest were not so fortunate some lost their way wandering back into granada others died from exhaustion and terror many were taken prisoners and those who still kept together mistook the route and came to a stand in a deep dark glen hemmed in by insurmountable rocks darkness was fast enveloping them increasing their danger and magnifying the horrors of their situation watch-fires were kindled by the enemy along the ridges of the mountains and the fierce moors flitted hither and thither in the red light like a multitude of evil spirits securing the captivity of their victims well-aimed arrows were darted among the unresisting soldiery who thinking now only of personal safety desperately sought to retrace their steps after struggling through almost impenetrable thickets scaling fearful precipices and leaping dark chasms a moiety of that brilliant army reached their own frontiers almost dead with fatigue and terror they left three of their most illustrious commanders and two brothers of the marquis of cadiz slain among the defiles to be mutilated by the revengeful moors or to be prey for the eagle's airy and one was taken a prisoner with no hope of ransom after these disasters the war would have ceased for a time but for a rash expedition undertaken by boabdil the young king of granada who was jealous of the renown which his father's knights had gained and determined to perform some exploit himself which should secure the loyalty of his adherents accordingly he summoned a large army which embraced the flower of moslem chivalry disregarding the ill-omened accident of breaking his lance against an arch as he passed through a gateway of the city at the head of his army he persisted in executing his purpose perhaps the more desperately from the repeated and mysterious warnings he received from the astrologers and because of an old prophecy which foretold that he would be the last king of granada the castilians having been informed of his design of investing lucena on the spanish frontiers provided that city with a strong garrison the count de cabra raised a small army and came in sight of lucena just as the moors were marching towards it on the opposite side the approach of the spanish army was partially concealed by the rolling hills among which they passed affording the moors only an occasional glimpse of troops thus multiplied infinitely to their alarmed vision the echoes of the loud clarions and trumpets that filled their ears impressed them with the approach of an immense army at the same time troops poured forth from the gates of the city imagining themselves already overpowered a portion of the moors fled leaving the brunt of the battle to the cavalry who soon obliged the rest to give way and retreat towards the zanil closely followed by their pursuers the panic and struggle for life were so great that numbers were precipitated into the waters grappling one another till they sank in a common grave the proudest blood of granada flowed from the banks and mingled with the rolling river that day a day immortalized in the mournful lamentations and ballads of a race who fought to perpetuate a nation that was doomed to be struck out from the kingdoms of the earth boabdil was often seen in the thickest of the melee conspicuous from being mounted upon a richly caparisoned white steed and wearing golden armor and a magnificent turban blazing with jewels his royal guard fell one after another around him unable to sustain himself longer or to hope for escape across the river he dismounted and concealed himself in a thicket a castilian soldier discovered his retreat and would have dispatched him after calling assistance had not the king revealed his rank this was the crowning feature of the day he was triumphantly led to the spanish camp and conducted to count cabra who received him with all the honor and respect due to the royal captive he was then escorted to the count's castle and entertained with munificent hospitality the most punctilious care being taken to make the golden plumaged bird forget that he was caged 
isabella received the tidings with tears as well as joy and sent him a message full of kindness and courtesy all her generous womanly sympathies were awakened for the unfortunate prince when a council convened to determine what was to be done with their captive they talked of delivering him to the vengeance of his father for a heavy ransom but isabella indignantly rejected the proposal deciding that he should be liberated and sent back to his country on condition of allegiance to the castilian sovereigns the promise of supplies to their troops and permission to pass unmolested through that portion of the country under his sway together with the payment of a large sum of money annually and the delivery of his son and several children of the nobility as hostages he was released and after a cordial interview with the king and queen was conducted by a brilliant escort to his own dominions in the loftiest towers of the alhambra his mother and beautiful young wife morema had watched daily for the coming of boabdil straining their eyes in vain beyond the vine-covered vega to catch a glimpse of the triumphant return of the gaily equipped cavaliers who had gone forth with buoyant hopes to win glory while still gazing far among the blue mountains for a sight of the muslim banners heralding the approach of the victors their keen eyes perceived a little band of horsemen skimming swiftly across the plain with beating hearts they returned to the state chamber to await tidings that were soon conveyed to them more loudly than words could have done in the blood-stained dusty habiliments that remained to the exhausted cavaliers who rushed with evil news to the presence of the queen regent the announcement of the capture of boabdil overwhelmed his wife and mother with grief and filled the city with lamentations old men and women wandered through the streets tearing their hair and throwing ashes upon their heads the wise were struck dumb with the unheard-of calamity and even the children united in the wailing cry that rose yet more mournfully than the sad cadence that prophesied the recoil of the first blow beginning with the words ay de mi alama the high-spirited sultana Aexa, unwilling to indulge a useless grief made an effort for boabdil's liberty offering an immense ransom and terms which for the most part were those the conquerors granted but the glory of granada had departed for no sooner had the degraded king returned to his dominions than aben hassan renewed his former animosity through abdallah el zagel a vigorous and fiery warrior who was appointed to succeed the old monarch now blind and infirm the new opposing king carried on a determined warfare with the fated boabdil's party till the palace of the alhambra and the streets of granada were streaming with the blood of the bravest moors who should have reserved their strength for the common defense of the kingdom ferdinand and isabella continued to take advantage of these destructive feuds pushing their conquests from town to town capturing the most important posts and strongest fortresses along the frontiers no memorable campaign occurred however till 1485 a year distinguished for the siege and capture of ronda isabella with all her household accompanied the army animating the soldiers with fresh courage and prompting the gallant knights and cavaliers to valiant deeds to deserve the smiles and commendation of their beautiful queen for whom it was glory to peril their lives her presence softened the horrors and sufferings of war as she always advised the most lenient and magnanimous conduct toward the vanquished and held back the murderous sword that almost universally follows in the track of victory she frequently reviewed the troops on horseback wearing light armor and addressed the soldiers with a perfect grace and strength united with unassumed modesty that won the admiration of the whole army any one of those thousands would probably have laid down his life in the defense of a queen regarded by all her subjects with the passionate devotion of a lover as well as with the awe which not only royalty but the purity and beauty of her character inspired 
to her the honor is due of first establishing the inestimable services of a hospital in the army she paid from her own revenues the skillful military surgeons and the expenses of six spacious tents provided with beds and everything necessary for the comfort of the sick and wounded it was denominated the queen's hospital she was always accompanied by the infanta isabella whom she loved with more than ordinary tenderness the sweetest and most confidential intercourse existed between them endearing them to each other with such strength of affection as nearly proved fatal when a final separation became necessary the campaign of fourteen eighty six opened under brilliant auspices vast preparations were made and once more the valiant warriors of spain emboldened by the presence of ferdinand filed out from the gates of cordova amidst floating banners the flourish of trumpets and the music of clarions and buoyed by the hopes of victory whereof they were more rationally certain from being thoroughly supplied with every provision necessary to a well-equipped army while they proceeded to the siege of loxa isabella remained at cordova assuming the sole administration of government and attending to civil and military business with surprising precision and skill the derangement of internal affairs increased during the prolonged absence of the sovereigns added to the thousand separate demands upon her time caused many an applicant to be unavoidably unheard among the throng who eagerly sought her presence was one who in lowly garb passed unnoticed through the streets of cordova abstracted and absorbed in the great dreams that daily pictured the glorious panorama of the western world and living a life of noble aspirations and intense longing to grasp the reality beyond the ocean that his keen vision had already spanned a life of hopes and aims exalting him far above the motley scornful multitude which to his unmindful sight passed dimly forth and back as seen in dreams impatient with the cold and reiterated refusals of an audience columbus succeeded in laying his gigantic plans before talavera the queen's confessor through whom he hoped to reach isabella's ear he had previously applied to john the second of portugal who rejected the chimerical ideas with disdain now he had a worse obstacle to encounter in the learned prelate's unconquerable aversion to any departure from the long-established theories too much occupied to bestow thought upon columbus's scheme isabella refused him admission with an indefinite promise of giving attention to the subject at some future day columbus impatient at the delay could only plunge into the scenes of warfare that now seemed to engulf every other interest after the capture of loxa ferdinand requested isabella's presence in the army to which she promptly responded with the princess isabella the ladies of her court and a numerous and brilliant train of attendants she set out for the camp the marquis of cadiz with a detachment of nobles and cavaliers met her on the frontiers and conducted her to the encampment in the vicinity of moalin the queen rode a chestnut mule seated on a saddle chair embossed with gold and silver the housings were of a crimson color and the bridle was of satin curiously wrought with letters of gold the infanta wore a skirt of fine velvet over others of brocade a scarlet mantilla of the moorish fashion and a black hat trimmed with gold embroidery the king rode forward at the head of his nobles to receive her he was dressed in a crimson doublet with breeches of yellow satin over his shoulders was thrown a mantle of rich brocade and a supravest of the same materials covered his cuirass by his side close girt he wore a moorish scimitar and beneath his bonnet his hair was confined by a cap of the finest stuff he was mounted on a noble war-horse of a bright chestnut color as they approached each other they bowed thrice uncovering their heads and saluted one another affectionately though with the stately ceremonies which accompanied every movement of their majesties the presence of isabella and her court in the camp spread universal joy 
gave new life to the soldiery and added to the brilliancy of the scene royal pavilions were reared in the midst of the encampment embellished with all the luxuries pertaining to a court and gay with the presence of the beautiful and distinguished there was the heroic marchioness of cadiz and the marchioness of moya better known as beatrix de bodidia together with the dignified presence of the grand cardinal mendoza a man reverenced for his learning and reliable qualities the gallant earl of rivers of england with his brave followers gonzalvo de cordova the notable captain of the royal guards and his famous brother don alonso the marquis of cadiz styled the mirror of andalusian chivalry the count de cabra the capturer of boabdil and a host of renowned knights with their numberless followers made up as famed and gorgeous an array as ever entered the battlefield and among this throng of haughty powerful nobles who burned to gain laurels to lay at the feet of the worshipped queen moved columbus still unnoticed still overshadowed by the bold and great whose emblazoned names in future years would pale before the radiance of the genius now despised by their prejudices the din of war drowned his pleadings and the poor but noble genoese could only raise his arm beside the common soldier to strike a common foe moline was captured its dungeons thrown open from whence poured forth christian captives whose fate had long been a mystery to their mourning relatives its mosques were converted into cathedrals colleges founded for the instruction of the moors in the catholic faith and arrangements made for the government of the conquered cities isabella universally exerted herself to alleviate the horrors of war showing such leniency and kindness toward her moslem subjects as secured a devotion almost equal to that of her own nation and when severe or cruel measures were applied it was because her remonstrances were overruled by ferdinand and the spanish leaders at the close of the campaign the sovereigns returned to spain making salamanca their place of royal residence here columbus succeeded through the influence of the marquis of cadiz and cardinal mendoza both men of enlightened minds in obtaining the appointment of a council to decide his claims talavera was designated to select the most learned and scientific men in the kingdom for this purpose many of them were equally pugnacious to innovations upon established theories and caused discussions which were likely to foil the long protracted hopes of columbus by their interminable length if not in their decision the spring of fourteen eighty seven came and the council without having effected anything was broken up by the preparations demanded for a new campaign ferdinand placed himself at the head of an army of twelve thousand horse and forty thousand foot and once more advanced toward the dominions of the moors a toilsome march over the mountains a rapid descent among the defiles and the army swept like a cloud of devouring locusts over the fair fields vineyards and gardens of granada leaving a scene of desolation behind it and at length settling in a broad valley at the extremity of which lay the city of malaga second only in importance to granada the approach to it however was rendered perilous by two well-guarded eminences commanding the valley both on the sea coast and the opposite side where the wild sierra receded into mountainous heights that overshadowed the city after a desperate defense by the moors the marquis of cadiz took possession of the position considered most dangerous from its exposure to attacks of bands concealed in the neighboring thickets the other most important point was secured by la vega the following morning the remainder of the army swept through the pass and defiled into a wide plain which surrounded the city upon three sides a fourth was washed by the waves of the ocean a spanish fleet rode in the harbor effectually cutting off supplies in that quarter thus the doomed city was completely encircled by a foe daily tightening its coils till the victim was crushed in the fearful embrace malaga was bravely defended by a noble moor named hamet el zegri renowned since the siege of ronda 
and appointed to this responsible post by el zagel who still disputed the crown with boabdil but for this weak prince malaga might have been rescued by the moors inasmuch as a valiant band of troops set out from granada to their assistance but were intercepted by boabdil and engaged in a bloody affray which disabled them after several weeks spent in the unsuccessful bombardment of the city the christians wearied with its determined resistance became discontented a rumor had reached the besieged that the spaniards were about to break up their camp this gave them fresh courage to prolong the struggle to undeceive them ferdinand immediately sent for isabella to join the army knowing her presence would dispel the dissatisfaction among the troops and would assure the infidels of their intentions to persevere isabella's arrival was greeted with every manifestation of joy the plain of malaga presented a scene like that of moline it was brilliant with gorgeously attired horsemen and glancing weapons gay with pavilions from which floated the royal standard and the interior of which was richly hung with silken draperies and otherwise luxuriously fitted for the presence of beautiful women of noble birth the wives or sisters of those in the camp the army was purified from the vices which usually accompany war gambling was prohibited under severe penalties blasphemy punished and prostitutes banished a state of things due to isabella's pious and virtuous regulations end of section eight Section 9 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 9. Isabella of Castile. Part 5. Immediately upon her arrival, she showed the humanity and mildness of her character by requesting the cessation of hostile operations, and caused terms of capitulation to be offered the inhabitants of Malaga. They would gladly have accepted these, but for the fierce chieftain El Zegri, who returned only a defiant answer. The siege was, therefore, prosecuted with redoubled vigor. An event occurred shortly after the queen's arrival, which occasioned great alarm for her safety. A wild moor named Agarby allowed himself to be taken prisoner, and, promising to reveal important information to the Spanish sovereigns, was conducted to the royal tent. The king being asleep, the queen refused to confer with the prisoner till he should awaken and be present at the audience. The moor was, therefore, led to an adjoining pavilion, where the Marchioness of Moya and Don Alvaro were playing a game of chess. Their magnificent apparel and distinguished bearing deceived Agarby, who, thinking himself in the presence of royalty, suddenly drew forth a dagger from the folds of his Moorish mantle and plunged it into the side of the unsuspecting Don Alvaro, then turned quick as lightning upon the Marchioness, who escaped injury by the weapon becoming entangled in the heavy embroidery of her robes in its descent. The attendants fell upon the assassin, dispatching him with numberless blows. The noise of the affray soon spread the alarm, and in revenge for the daring attempt, his body was thrown from an engine into the besieged city. Spanish historians denominate him a fanatic. His own countrymen might have immortalized him as a hero who, in the face of certain death, made one last effort to arrest the departing glory of the kings of Granada by sending into the captivity of death the crowned instigators of their downfall. The vigilance of sentinels was redoubled, and an additional guard placed upon the royal quarters. Though Isabella was disturbed and alarmed at her danger, she still enforced her wishes to spare the destruction of Malaga and its inhabitants. Capitulation was again offered, but rejected with disdain, 
notwithstanding the famine which had reduced the besieged to the necessity of eating the flesh of horses, cats, dogs, and boiled leaves. To this distress a pestilence was added, arising from the use of such unwholesome food. Reduced to uttermost extremity, their numbers rapidly diminishing, and their places of defense giving way under the increasing fire and battering engines of the Spaniards, El Zegre at length sent an embassy to Ferdinand, accepting the offered terms, to which the king replied that it was too late, as they must now abide by such terms as their conquerors chose to offer. After remonstrances, threats, and defiance on the part of the Moorish general, he was at length obliged to surrender Malaga unconditionally, having bravely maintained its defense for three months. Ferdinand and Isabella entered the city at the head of a triumphant procession, and went in state to the Cathedral of St. Mary, where Mass was performed, and thanks given to the God of Armies for enabling them to establish the Catholic faith in the land of the infidels. The Te Deum was solemnly chanted, followed by all the usual demonstrations of victory. In the meantime, the inhabitants of Malaga awaited the decision of their fate with the additional terror of suspense. The dungeons were opened, and the Christian captives, who had been chained there for years, were led before Isabella in the presence of the assembled multitude. Sons, brothers, husbands, long mourned as dead, were recognized among the dejected, cadaverous beings, with cries of joy at the reunion and tears at the sight of their suffering. Isabella wept with them, had them carefully provided for, and enabled them to return to their families. Strange inconsistency that could release captives in a foreign land with tears, while, in her own dominions, thousands innocently suffered a more horrible captivity in the dungeons of the Inquisition. And strange infatuation that should lead her, immediately after the release of Spanish prisoners, for whom her tears had flowed, to enslave a host of the most beautiful Moorish maidens, for herself and friends, tearing them from homes and loved ones no less dear because the crescent was an emblem of their faith, though this was sufficient to make them unfeeling in the eyes of the Spaniards. The terrified inhabitants were ordered to appear in the spacious courtyard of the Alcazaba to hear their doom pronounced. Wasted by famine, and exhausted with fearful watching, they clung in despairing silence to one another, pale and trembling. They were anxious as to their impending fate, yet hoping for the generous treatment shown towards other conquered cities. Here and there a sullen moor stood apart with folded arms and rebellious spirit, haughtily awaiting the sentence he knew full well would be no light one from the exasperated conquerors. Breathlessly the multitude listened till the dreaded decree of hopeless slavery was passed upon them, then sent up a long mournful cry that might have touched a heart of stone. O oh, Malaga, renowned and beautiful, what shall become of thy old men and thy matrons, thy sons and thy maidens, when they shall feel the galling yoke of bondage, cried they in tones of agonized grief. Daughters clung to mothers, children in vain supplicated the protection of their fathers, the family ties were broken. Some were destined to the burning coasts of Africa, some were distributed in the beautiful plains of Italy, while the noblest and fairest were selected to embellish the palaces of Spain, in subjection to those whom they hated as infidels as well as oppressors. Ferdinand would have put them all to the sword but for the remonstrances of his more humane consort. Though their policy had always been marked by a magnanimity that won them a worldwide fame in those days of savage warfare, the rapacious Ferdinand, fearing that the inhabitants would conceal their wealth, secured it by offering freedom to them at a ransom so enormous that, despite all the gold, precious stones, and merchandise the duped victims could lay at his feet, it availed them nothing. 
these traits that gradually became more prominent in his character repulsed the upright purity and tenderness of isabella's more refined exalted nature and chilled the love that had at first united their interests and aims but whatever isabella's disappointment was upon a clearer perception of the soul that years made more transparent to her insight she never compromised the dignity of either by revealing it to those who surrounded them the year succeeding the capture of malaga was more remarkable for its reverses than successes after a short campaign ferdinand withdrew his forces isabella's residence during the ensuing winter was at valladolid and saragossa where she was entirely engrossed in domestic affairs and the education of her children the princess isabella was her constant companion and confidant relieving her mother's sorrows by her gentle sweet sympathy her eldest and promising son don juan often diverted her from oppressive troubles but all her motherly anxieties were awakened for her second daughter joanna who having always been subject to fits was threatened with idiocy or insanity the infant catherine destined to a sad fate and known as catherine of aragon was at this time affianced to prince arthur son of henry the seventh of england an event which sealed a long unbroken peace between the two nations the brilliant campaign of 1489 decided the fate of Granada. An army was raised of 15,000 horse and 80,000 foot, embracing the most distinguished leaders and hardy knights of Spain, together with troops furnished by allies. Ferdinand led his legions once more over the mountainous barriers, determined to summon all their strength for a final victory that should terminate this long, disastrous war. The siege of Bassa was determined upon, as it was the capital of El Zegel's dominions and the most important post to be obtained. A long and fierce resistance, however, dampened the ardor of the Spaniards, and after suffering several reverses in skirmishes and attacks upon the town, and dreading the severity of the fast approaching winter, they were so entirely disheartened as to unitedly desire the king to return to Castile and await the following spring for the furtherance of designs which would detain and expose them to certain death by the hardships of the cold season and the cutting off of supplies by the breaking up of the roads over the mountains. Even the most heroic leaders advised Ferdinand to abandon the siege and scarcely one in the whole army opposed it but the sagacious commander of Leon uncertain what course to take and unwilling to disband his army without a single conquest ferdinand sent his embassy to isabella who resided at hyene a place nearest the scene of action and most convenient for communication her reply full of hope courage and energy promising the faithful discharge of her engagement to furnish supplies to the army without intermission at whatever cost or labor reassured the dispirited army with fresh vigor they made preparations for the approaching winter and the astounded moors of bassa suddenly beheld a city of houses and streets rise as if by magic where only light tents had sheltered the besiegers walls of mud thatched with timber constituted the houses of the nobility palisades joined at the top and intertwined with boughs protected the common soldiers shortly after the completion of these huts a severe storm swept them all to the earth torrents rolled down from the mountains swelling the streams to an impassable depth and rapidity the mountain roads were blocked up by fallen rocks and trees and deep fissures were cut by the descending floods Alarm was depicted on every continent now that supplies and intercourse with their own country were completely cut off. Two or three days of painful suspense ensued when a messenger arrived from Isabella exhorting them to hold their position, for the roads should be quickly repaired. With incredible alacrity and skillful management, she succeeded in the reconstruction of the roads. Her workmen made new ones, bridged the swollen rivers, 
and established a line of fourteen thousand mules, which constantly conveyed supplies of every description to the army. The immense expense incurred she defrayed by pawning the crown jewels, plate, and personal ornaments, by large sums borrowed of wealthy individuals who, for their reimbursement, trusted to the word of the queen, a sufficient guarantee for any risk so faithful was she in performing her promises, and, by the treasures of the convents and monasteries, thrown open to her. Thus, to the indefatigable efforts of this high-spirited, admirable woman, who wonderfully united feminine qualities with masculine wisdom, energy, and skill, was owing the brilliant and decisive conquests that succeeded. Bassa was still defended with determined valor and strength, drawn from the dependence of the fate of Granada upon the loss or retention of this royal stronghold. The Spaniards again lost patience with the prolonged defense, looked to the queen for new inspiration, and believing her presence would hasten the termination of the siege, entreated her to join them. Accompanied by the Princess Isabella, the Marchioness of Moya, and other ladies of her court, she arrived at the camp in November, the sixth month of the siege. When the Moors beheld her gay cavalcade streaming from among the mountains, knowing what a talisman of success lay in her presence, they beat their breasts in dismay and despair, exclaiming, Now is the fate of Bassa decided. From the moment of her appearance, says the historian, a change came over the scene, no more of the cruel skirmishes which before had occurred every day, no report of artillery or clashing of arms or any of the rude sounds of war were to be heard, but all seemed disposed to reconciliation and peace. Bassa almost immediately surrendered, and the triumphant Christians entered the city amid the firing of artillery, waving of banners, and the ringing of bells, hateful sights and sounds to the vanquished, the Alcaide, who had bravely sustained the defense, was loaded with civilities and presents. Overcome by the same kindness and sweet sympathy which gave Isabella such power over her own subjects, he knelt before her in admiration and offered his services in her cause thenceforth. She replied graciously and created him one of her knights. The monarch El Zagel, then in a neighboring fortress, knowing how fruitless resistance would be, resigned himself to a fate he could no longer avert. What Allah wills he brings to pass in his own way. Had he not decreed the fall of Granada, this good sword might have saved it. But his will be done, exclaimed the fallen king, with the solemn gravity and unchanging features characteristic of the Moors. Ferdinand appointed him king of Andres, subject to the crown of Castile. This shadow of royalty could not divert him from his melancholy downfall. In a short time he resigned the despised crown and left the scene that continually reminded him of the departed glory of Granada. He took refuge among the Africans, who seized upon the riches he carried with him and left him to end his days in extreme poverty and obscurity. Boabdil was now called upon to yield up his capital and acknowledge the supreme sovereignty of Castile and Aragon. The inhabitants of Granada refused the demand, and sent a message of defiance to the conquerors. Unwilling to open another siege so late in the season, they returned to the city of Seville to recruit, perfectly at ease in the knowledge that Granada was theirs except in name. In the following spring, the nuptials of the Princess Isabella and young Alfonso of Portugal were celebrated in a succession of balls, fetes, and tournaments, which were gladly welcomed after the toils and hardships of war. But the queen mingled in these rejoicings with a heavy heart, dreading separation from a daughter who had enlisted her strongest affections, and who regarded her own departure with equal and foreboding sadness. Columbus again appeared at court in the interval of peace, to present his claims, he was referred to the Council of Salamanca, which, after a three years' consideration of the matter, had decided that, 
the scheme proposed was vain and impossible that it did not become such great princes to engage in an enterprise of the kind on such weak grounds as had been advanced this was the decision of spain's most learned and scientific men yet there was a minority in the council of more enlightened views who would fain have encouraged the great discoverer and so far prevailed on the sovereigns as to induce them to hold out promises of future and more explicit attention to the subject when the war of granada had ceased in april fourteen ninety one the king assembled an army of fifty thousand to strike a final blow that would set his seal upon the entire kingdom of granada accompanied by don juan now created a knight and the commanders who had gained numberless honors during the long wars the unfailing marquis of cadiz the valiant count cabra don alonso de aguilar and his brother gonzalvo de cordova of brilliant renown in the after italian campaigns with such supporters king ferdinand once more encamped upon the banks of the senil facing the royal city of the moslems the last of all the strongholds of the kingdom that remained free and independent the vega stretched away from its frowning battlements covered with a wild entangled growth of vines groves and gardens whose beauty had been desolated in the long struggle but had sprung up again in untrained luxuriance in a soil enriched with the blood poured freely upon it the river had gradually withdrawn from its artificial channels rolling through the plain as musically as if a crimson tide never mingled with the pure waters ever fed by the rills which like ribbons of silver unwound from the hills the grand solid mountains rising beyond alone remained unshaken and unchanged a chain of unavailing bulwarks towards which the eyes of every moslem had often turned watching in dread and hatred the coming of the myriads yearly poured forth from those rugged defiles this last defiant approach to the very walls of their beloved and last remaining city filled the moorish knights with uncontrollable vengeance and indignation thousands of the bravest and choicest of moslem chivalry were shut within its walls determined to sacrifice their heart's blood before they would yield their royal palaces or see christian monarchs seated upon their throne undaunted by the encircling foe and caring less for the horrors of a famine than submission to a foreign yoke they daily sent forth the best warriors to challenge the spanish knights to combat upon the vega which became the strange scene of innumerable single-handed battles and daring exploits that seemed more the picturings of romance than the terrible reality of war prompted on one side by bigotry and on the other by a desperate defense of home liberty and kingdom the spanish army met with a disaster which proved in the end the speedier termination of the siege isabella who was present in the camp occupied a magnificent pavilion belonging to the marquis of cadiz which with his usual gallantry he had resigned to her use one night when all were wrapped in secure slumber the cry of fire proceeding from the royal quarters roused the whole camp to arms supposing the enemy were upon them the flames which had caught in the hangings of the queen's tent from a carelessly placed taper spread with rapidity and were not extinguished till after the loss of a large quantity of plate jewels and brocade and the costly decorations of the pavilions occupied by the nobility isabella herself narrowly escaped injury as a memorial of her gratitude to god for the preservation and in token of her determination never to abandon the vega till granada had surrendered she caused a city of substantial houses to be erected in the place where the encampment stood immediately the soldiers became artisans and instead of the shock the shout the groan of war the din of industry went up to the ears of the amazed moors who beheld in the rising city a token of inflexible determination that it was useless and fatal to combat 
in less than three months la santa fe was completed and was long after the boast of the spaniards for its freedom from the pollution of heresy boabdil would have yielded at once but dared not oppose the undiminished courage of the inhabitants who were still resolved to die in defense of their last possessions although fully aware of the impossibility of retaining their position eventually secret negotiations were carried on however with the king's vizier sometimes within the sacred precincts of the alhambra and sometimes at midnight in the little village of churiana which ended in boabdil's betrayal of granada into the hands of the christians end of section nine Section 10 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine H. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 10. Isabella of Castile. Part 6. In the meantime, Columbus had retired from the Spanish court in disgust, and prepared to visit the King of France, who had written him in an encouraging tone. While on his way, he was detained at the convent of La Rabida by his friend the guardian Juan Perez, formerly confessor to the Queen. Comprehending the greatness of Columbus' designs, and anxious that his sovereigns should lose neither the golden opportunity of extending their dominions to an incalculable extent, nor the glory of perfecting the gigantic schemes, in defiance of the world's brand of fanaticism, he offered to seek an interview with Isabella, and make one more effort in behalf of one with whom a continent had been unknowingly rejected. The good monk arrived at Santa Fe, and having obtained an audience, eloquently expostulated with Isabella. She became warmly interested in his representations, and, urged by two eminent men and the intelligent Marchioness of Moya, consented to receive Columbus, sending him substantial evidence of her favor in the presentation of a well-filled purse, a mule, and habiliments necessary to his appearance at court. Overjoyed at the near prospect of the consummation of his hopes, he hastened to Santa Fe, arriving in time to witness the surrender of Granada. Elated with success, the sovereigns and court were ready to listen approvingly to new plans. Columbus appeared before them, adding the power of his inspired presence, lofty demeanor, and the eloquence of his beaming, benignant face to persuasions in which he pictured in glowing description the realms he should add to their dominions and the converts that should be made among the heathen who peopled these imaginary regions in barbarous magnificence. Warriors and courtiers, knights and fair women graced the interview, some listening with admiration and enthusiasm, others scoffing at the eloquent pleader, for presuming to reveal his wild dreams in presence of the majestic pair, more imposingly royal than ever, now that they were thrice crowned. Isabella listened approvingly. The thought of converting the benighted heathen in the supposed continent was a strong motive of acceptance, but the cautious Ferdinand had no idea of complying with terms in which Columbus demanded, for himself and heirs, the title and authority of admiral and viceroy over all lands discovered by him, with one-tenth of the profits. Terms which Talavera, already appointed Archbishop of Granada, haughtily assured the king, savored of the highest degree of arrogance, and should be unbecoming in their highnesses to grant to a needy foreign adventurer. Although Columbus saw the means of accomplishing his great schemes almost within his grasp, he proudly spurned every offer which did not secure to him the titles and emoluments due to his achievements. Refusing farther conference, he indignantly left the court, and mounting his mule, turned his back upon the scene of conquest that to him seemed child's play, 
in comparison with the magnificent world to whose shores he would have winged even a single vessel had such a prize been within his reach in defiance of the superstition which kept the people aloof from his project and in scorn at the foolhardiness of the learned while he angrily hastened across the vega towards the mountain roads his friends were eagerly expostulating with the queen assuring her that he would well deserve the reward he asked if he succeeded and if he failed nothing would be required Yielding at last to her own generous impulses, she determined not to regard Ferdinand's opposition or the advice of over-cautious counsellors. "'I will assume the undertaking for my own crown of Castile,' said she, "'and am ready to pawn my jewels to defray the expenses of it if the funds of the treasury shall be found inadequate.' A messenger was quickly dispatched for Columbus, who was overtaken a few leagues on his route. Assured that the orders came from the queen herself, he gladly returned to Santa Fe, where he met a gracious reception, and at last received from her own lips the acceptance of his terms, definitely concluded April 17, 1492. With accustomed promptness, Isabella immediately gave orders for the equipment of two vessels, the third being provided by Juan Perez of La Rabida and the Pinzones, distinguished mariners of Palos. The fleet was manned with great difficulty, but at length preparations were completed, and on the 30th of April, after partaking of the sacrament and confessing themselves, Columbus and his motley crew spread their sails and floated away to unknown regions from which they were never expected to return. Granada had surrendered, and at the triumphant entrance of the Spanish monarchs, the unfortunate Boabdil met them, and would have dismounted to do them homage, but was hastily prevented and kindly embraced by Ferdinand, and received with cordial regard by Isabella, who delivered to him his son, detained at the Spanish court as a hostage during the last years of the war. Boabdil then delivered up the keys of the Alhambra. They are thine, O king, since Allah so decreed it. Use thy success with clemency and moderation, said he mournfully, turning away and passing through one of the gates of Granada, which he requested might immediately be walled up, that no other should pass after him. He began the tedious route to the Alpujarras, arriving at the last eminence from which he could behold the royal city. He stopped and turned to look upon its rich palaces and the beloved sacred Alhambra, now desecrated with the blazing cross and waving banners of the conquerors, gazed upon the wide vega with its fragrant vines and orange groves, followed the windings of the Sanil, looked afar upon the minarets and towers that shot up from the cities clustered in the luxurious plain, and then at the blue heights of the rocky barriers he had thought a safeguard to his kingdom, rudely wrenched from his weak grasp. The scene and its associations were too much for the banished prince. He covered his face in his Moorish mantle and burst into tears. "'You do well to weep like a woman for what you could not defend like a man,' exclaimed his haughty, unfeeling mother, adding the sting of reproach to his sorrow. "'Alas, when were woes ever equal to mine?' returned the unhappy prince pursuing his desolate journey to the barren regions assigned to him in lieu of his splendid possessions. The rock where he stood and mourned his fate is still known by the poetical appellation El Ultimo Sospiro del Moro, the last sigh of the Moor. His final career was like that of his uncle El Zagel. Disgusted with his petty dominions, he sold them for an insignificant sum and passed into Fez, where he fell in battle in the service of an African prince, losing his life in another's cause, though he dared not die in his own. The kingdom of Granada was now wholly in possession of the Christians, after a struggle through 741 years, during which the Arabian Empire had lessened in every succeeding generation, and finally absorbed in the Spanish nation after an unceasing war of ten years. 
the event was commemorated by processions and demonstrations of triumph, not only in Rome and many of the cities of the continent, but also in London, to say nothing of the joy manifested throughout Spain. Immediately after the close of the war, the death of one of its most brilliant supporters caused general mourning. The Marquis of Cadiz, who had been present during every campaign, from the surprise of Zahara to the fall of Granada, expired the 28th of August, 1492. The king and queen, with the court, wore deep mourning for the cavalier who was esteemed, like the Cid, both by friend and foe. But a far greater calamity fell upon Spain at the same time, and a louder lamentation went up from palace and hovel. After Ferdinand and Isabella had entered Granada, they issued an edict for the expulsion of the Jews from their dominions. The inquisitors represented the impossibility of their conversion, and recommended banishment as the only method of purging the land of such heinous offenders. To send from Spain a class of people comprising the most industrious and skillful of her artisans, and the wealthiest portion of her subjects, in many cases intermarried with the nobility, seemed to Isabella an impolitic measure, as well as inhuman, in tearing from their homes those who claimed a long line of ancestry in renowned Spain, where their interests and affections were entirely centered. She would have rejected a proposition so repellent to her kindly, generous nature. But, while negotiating with a representative Jew, who came to offer thirty thousand ducats toward defraying the expenses of the Moorish war, thinking thus to gain favor for his people, Torquemada, the Inquisitor General, rushed into the apartment, and, holding up a crucifix, exclaimed, Judas Iscariot sold his master for thirty pieces of silver. Your Highnesses would sell him anew for thirty thousand. Here he is. Take him. Barter him away. And throwing the crucifix down before the astonished sovereigns, fled from their presence. Instead of resenting his unasked interference, they were overawed by his denunciations. Without farther hesitation, Isabella affixed her name to the decree, thus again silencing the promptings of her own better judgment, and, in the name of a religion whose teachers had possessed themselves of her conscience, inflicted another scourge upon the subjects who adored her, and whose cries of suffering, if they reached her ear, could not swerve her from her stern sense of duty. She might have wept when she saw them streaming forth in little bands after selling their property at immense sacrifice, not knowing where to turn from persecution since all the world spurned them. She might have been touched with compassion for the sick and helpless, dragging over the painful route, or pitied the young maidens educated in luxurious abodes and sent forth homeless, or when the exiles reached the frontiers, fainting with hunger and fatigue, or scattered through Portugal, Italy, Africa, and even Turkey, their numbers dwindled away in consequence of murders, exhaustion, or the plague, which strewed their pathway with the dead and dying. If she could have witnessed all this torture, tears might have welled abundantly from the depths of her sensitive heart, but they would have flowed without prompting a revocation of the fiat any more than the lamentations of the Moors would have stayed her determination to make theirs a Christian land. Spain must be cleansed from heresy, was the continued teaching of the stern Torquemada in her childhood. Spain must be cleansed from heresy, was his warning admonition in her girlhood. Spain must and shall be cleansed from heresy, he boldly demanded when she ascended the throne. When we know with what unquestioning confidence the Catholics to this day commit their consciences to the keeping of confessors, we need not wonder at the religious errors that darkened Isabella's character, or why she should have yielded to the advice of grim and cruel monks, instead of regarding the dictates of her own truer soul. In the following year, 1493, the court, still residing at Barcelona, was struck with unutterable surprise by the reception of letters from Columbus, 
announcing his return to Spain and the success of his voyage. Everyone was on tiptoe to see and do honor to the illustrious man who, a year before, they had brushed past with curling lip. Isabella was impatient for an interview, and commanded his attendance at court, whither he quickly repaired, accompanied by a few Indians he had brought with him, and bearing samples of the various produce of the islands he had discovered, together with strange animals and birds of gaudy plumage. It was the proudest moment of his life, when, seated in the presence of the monarchs, who received him with unheard of distinction, and in the hearing of the same learned scholars who formerly had looked upon him as a visionary, denouncing his theories as silly vagaries, he gave a glowing description of his discoveries in the exploration of an ocean never before traversed. He had torn aside the mystery that for ages had veiled the western horizon, and now that he held up a new world to their view, they clothed it with the golden tissue of their imagination, and exalted the bold voyager as extravagantly as they had before denounced him. Crowds followed him wherever he went, and he was everywhere received with the honors usually reserved for those of noble birth. The poor Genoese who, in his younger years, had sighed in vain for a sail to wing his material self where his spirit daily wandered, at last had realized his visions, and sat before kings, the greatest conqueror of the age. He had fought with poverty, contempt, ridicule, and the derision of the whole world. He had gone amidst the mingled jeers and pity of old experienced navigators to combat waves which, he was assured, would bear him to purgatory, to the outskirts of the earth, or to desolate regions where diabolic imps would forever enchain him with spells. He had fought the prejudices of his mutinous crew and commanded them into submission. He had waged one long battle from early youth to late manhood, in which he had gained a continent to lay at the feet of his sovereigns. Well might he bear his honors with noble dignity." But no adulation or acknowledgments were so grateful to him as the testimonial of regard for his services given by Isabella. She caused a fleet of seventeen vessels to be fitted out to promote his discoveries. At his departure she provided, among other stipulations, for the interests of the heathen, forbidding them being seized as slaves. She enjoined Columbus to treat them well and lovingly, and to chastise in the most exemplary manner all who should offer the natives the slightest molestation. These arrangements Isabella assumed herself, since her worthy prelates could not decide if it would be Christian or not to enslave them. Thus she invinced the justice of her character when exercising her own judgment. News reached her during his third voyage in 1498 of the violation of these especial charges, added to other delinquencies, all of which were grossly misrepresented by his enemies. She showed her deep displeasure at this by ordering all the Indians who had been shipped to Spain to be returned to their own land, and such as had been sent to any market to be restored immediately. A person called Boabdil was also sent with full powers to make arrests in Hispaniola of those who had disobeyed her commands. Making the most of his commission, he ordered the admiral before him, and putting fetters upon him, conveyed him to Spain. Columbus bore these sad reverses with the same lofty spirit in which he had received distinction. But he was quickly released on arriving in Spain, where everyone was indignant at this outrage upon the man to whom so much was due. The court was residing at Granada when the king and queen, mortified and grieved at this excess of their orders, and willing to repair the indignity, sent a large sum of money and rich habiliments to the discoverer with a request to appear at court. Hastening to Granada, he sought the presence of the benevolent queen. At the sight of him, and at the remembrance of the unkind requitals from her own hand, as it were, towards one who had rendered her such glorious services, she could not restrain her tears. Reaching forth her hand, 
she offered consolatory words to heal his wounded spirit. Overcome with this unexpected reception, he threw himself at her feet and wept aloud. Both the king and queen exempted him from the blame which had been attached to him by enemies, restored him to his honors, and, in 1502, sent him on a fourth voyage of discovery. Isabella was destined never to see his return home, as accumulated afflictions were rapidly undermining her constitution. The Princess Isabella had, some time before, been deprived of her youthful husband, Alfonso of Portugal, after a union of but five months, his death being occasioned by a fall from his horse. She returned to her mother, depressed with grief from which nothing could divert her, and the melancholy indulgence of which preyed upon her naturally delicate constitution. While Isabella watched her daughter with anxious and foreboding care, she was called to the deathbed of the Queen Dowager, her mother, to whom she had devoted herself with dutiful attention, notwithstanding the many cares that demanded her time. A few years after the death of Alfonso, the Princess Isabella was prevailed upon to accept the suit of Emmanuel, King of Portugal, who became a passionate admirer of the sweet and gentle princess during her residence at Lisbon. She would not give her acceptance till he promised to expel every Jew from his dominions, a stipulation that made him hesitate for a time. But he was too fond of her to allow such a barrier, and accordingly the despised and hated Jews, who had taken refuge there from Spain, were again sent forth in exile. Ferdinand was too much occupied in affairs with the French and Italians to give much heed to domestic arrangements. It was important, however, to his politic schemes to secure the friendship of Austria and England, and accordingly family alliances were arranged to cement the good feeling existing. In 1496, a marriage was concluded between Prince Juan, their only son, and Margaret of Austria, and between the Infanta Joanna and Philip, Archduke of Austria, son and heir of the Emperor Maximilian, while the youngest, Infanta Catherine, was affianced to Arthur, Prince of Wales, both too young to admit of an immediate marriage. At the close of the summer, a gallant and beautiful armada was fitted out, ready to convey the young Princess Joanna to foreign shores. Isabella, whose affectionate heart clung tenaciously to her children, accompanied her daughter to the place of embarkation, deferring their separation to the last moment before the fleet sailed. After bidding farewell to her beloved child, she returned in her boat to the shore, but the tide had risen so rapidly that no dry footing could be found for her on the beach. The sailors were preparing to drag the boat farther upon the strand when Gonzalvo de Cordova, but lately returned from an Italian campaign, and covered with honors, being present, attired in a rich and elegant court dress, gallantly waded into the water, and, lifting the queen in his arms, bore her safely to the shore, amid shouts of applause from the delighted spectators. End of section 10 Section 11 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 11. Isabella of Castile, Part 7. After Joanna had embarked, the weather became tempestuous, and the long absence of the fleet without tidings alarmed Isabella, already overburdened with anxieties. She consulted the most experienced navigators as to the safety of the fleet, suffering distressful fears, till the welcome news came of the safe arrival of the princess in Flanders. Though not without the loss of several ships and many of her attendants, her marriage with Philip was celebrated with great pomp in the city of Lille. The same fleet that bore her to the Austrian prince was to convey Marguerite to Spain. 
after the refitment of the vessels, she embarked, and arrived early in March 1497, having experienced a severe tempest. She was cordially received by the Spanish monarchs and Prince Juan, who eagerly hastened to meet her. The marriage was celebrated in April with magnificence. The ceremony was performed by the Archbishop of Toledo, in the presence of the nobility of Castile and Aragon. The event was followed by a continued round of splendid festivities, in which Marguerite and her Flemish attendants participated with an easy gaiety that caused surprise and remark among the stately and formal Spaniards. Soon after this, Ferdinand and Isabella attended the nuptials of their unusually loved daughter Isabella, celebrated without parade in a little town on the frontiers. While thus happily engaged, the king and queen received an alarming summons to Salamanca, where Prince Juan had become suddenly and dangerously ill. Before their arrival, he failed so rapidly that no hopes were entertained for his recovery. He expired in October 1497, in the twentieth year of his age. Thus, at a stroke, the Spanish sovereigns were deprived of an heir whose character and education Isabella had carefully superintended in order to prepare him for the important station he was expected to fill. His talents and admirable qualities endeared him to the nation, which hoped much under the administration of so wise, temperate, and benignant a prince. All Spain was in mourning, but the affliction fell upon none so heavily as the doting mother, who could find no consolation in the vain splendor of royalty. Her deep piety alone prepared her to meet adversity, as it had borne her through prosperity without arrogance. She received the mournful tidings in the touching language of resignation. The Lord hath given, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be his name. The succession now devolved upon the Queen of Portugal, but before the formal recognition of her right had been instituted, death claimed her also. This occurrence, though not so great a national calamity as the loss of Prince Juan, was a fatal stroke to Isabella, from which she never fully recovered. The young infant that cost its mother's life was happily a son, named Miguel, in honor of the saint's day on which he was born. The delicate, helpless child, unconscious of its magnificent destiny, was born in state through the kingdoms of its inheritance, to receive the allegiance of the grandees, and amidst solemn and pompous ceremonies was proclaimed successor to Ferdinand and Isabella and to Emmanuel of Portugal. Thus, above the head of the little sleeper, almost hidden in the satins and costly lace of royal babyhood, were suspended a multiplicity of crowns that, when encircling the brow of the young prince, would make him king of Portugal, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, Granada, Naples, and Sicily. Too brilliant a destiny for a cradled infant who, as if already pierced with the thorns that thickly line a golden crown, pined away and died before it reached its second year. These successive calamities were overpowering to the sensitive queen. Still, after her recovery from a severe illness, induced by her excessive grief, she continued to exert herself for the welfare of her subjects and the furtherance of every project for the advancement of the nation and the interests of religion. On the death of Cardinal Mendoza, Archbishop of Seville, in 1495, she appointed Jimenez his successor, who, a short time previous, had been induced to accept the office of confessor to Her Majesty. Knowing nothing of his new dignities, he was called to the royal presence to open dispatches from the Pope. After humbly kissing the missive, he broke the seal and was overwhelmed to find the contents addressed to himself with the title of Archbishop of Toledo. Without waiting to examine it farther and exclaiming, This cannot be for me, he dropped it in consternation and fled from the apartment. Messengers were sent to command his return, 
but he was not to be found till a courier overtook him on his way to the monastery at Ocaña, whither he was traveling on foot in the blazing sun at his best speed. He was with difficulty prevailed on to return, but no entreaties of the monarchs could induce him to accept so high an office, for which he declared himself totally unfitted, and which would deprive him of his unobtrusive holy life in the cloisters. He had been the jest and the fear of the gay courtiers, when now and then his pale spectral face and thin but muscular form came among them, clothed in coarse garments, girdled with a rope, and all the more humble from its contrast with their own gay trappings. For six months he steadily refused the appointment, till a command of obedience arrived from the Pope, compelling him to occupy the chair of primacy. He still continued to appear on foot in humble garb, till, assured by Isabella that his excessive austerity and plainness would degrade the office in the eyes of the people, he assumed the state and magnificence that characterized his predecessors. But beneath his silken robes, he kept his coarse Franciscan dress, abstained from the luxuries that daily loaded his table, and slept upon a hard mattress so arranged as to be concealed in the downy couch that was apparently his resting place. Stern, inflexible, bigoted, nothing could deter him from executing plans once formed. He began a thorough reformation in the monasteries and convents, into which deplorable vices and abuses had crept. Isabella countenanced his efforts, notwithstanding the general opposition to Jimena's severity, often visiting the convents, taking with her a distaff or embroidery, setting an example of industry and endeavoring to purify the frivolous character of the inmates by her pious instructions. Jimenez disregarded the express provisions of the treaty between Granada and Castile, and undertook the bold measure of converting the Moors. Taking up his residence for a short time in Granada, he began by collecting all the volumes of Moslem literature that he could lay hands upon, reserving only a few medical works for his own shelves, and consigned the rest to the flames in a public square in the city. His daring infringement of the people's rights and inquisitorial enforcement of a hated religion occasioned a revolt which threatened his life, but he refused to fly for safety, boldly confronting the mob and declaring his willingness to endure martyrdom. By the adroit interference of the Archbishop of Granada, who was greatly beloved by the inhabitants, the disturbance was quelled, and in the end Jimenez triumphed. Isabella was greatly incensed at his high-handed measures, and wrote him a severe letter, to which he replied by his presence, ascribing his conduct to a worthy zeal for the conversion of the infidels. He recommended that the sovereigns should condemn the delinquents for treason and offer them pardon on condition of renouncing their faith. Isabella did not accept this advice, yet imprisoned the leaders of the revolt. Many, from fear, emigrated, and the panic led nearly all the remaining inhabitants to accept the Catholic belief. All Christendom was astonished at this miracle the more wonderful from the well-known hatred its subjects entertained for the religion they had assented to. Jimenez was henceforth venerated as a saint, his admirers asserting that he had achieved greater triumphs than even Ferdinand and Isabella, since they had conquered only the soil, while he had gained the souls of Granada. In 1500, the birth of a son, the celebrated Charles V, to Philip and Joanna, gave universal joy, and as on the death of the Queen of Portugal and her heirs, the succession would devolve on the young infant through Joanna, the Spanish monarchs requested the presence of the child's parents in Spain, that their rights might be recognized. Philip did not comply with the invitation till the following year, being too much occupied in the pursuit of pleasure to secure his interests. The tour was finally made, 
accompanied by brilliant fetes and rejoicings throughout the nation. Arrived at Toledo, where the court then was, Philip so betrayed his aversion to business and his dislike to the stateliness of Castilian ceremonies as to alarm the sovereigns concerning his capability to occupy the Spanish throne. Isabella was more deeply grieved in noting his open neglect of her daughter, whom she again clasped in her arms after a long separation, listening with painful solicitude to a weeping account of his infidelity and his repulsion of a heart that clung to him with tenacious affection and was unappreciated by him because encased in so plain a setting. As soon as Joanna was duly recognized heir to the Spanish crown by the courts of Castile and Aragon, Philip, impatient at the restraint upon his free habits, and despising the formalities of the court, intimated his intention to set out immediately for France. This was warmly opposed by Ferdinand and Isabella, who represented to him the importance of remaining long enough to become familiar with the usages and interests of their kingdom, and to secure the good will of his future subjects. Besides, Joanna's delicate health required repose, and the open war with France might expose him to an uncivil reception. He persisted in his determination, leaving Joanna, who was unable to accompany him, inconsolable. From the moment of the departure of her idolized husband, she fell into a deep melancholy, from which nothing could arouse her. The birth of a son, named Ferdinand in honor of the king, did not dispel her strange mood, but each day gave more decisive proof of mental derangement. This was an additional grief to Isabella, whose health was rapidly failing under her accumulated sorrows and cares, aggravated by the exposures and fatigue to which she was subject in being frequently called to Joanna, who resided at Medina del Campo. She was summoned on one occasion when no one could prevail upon the unfortunate princess to return to her apartments after mounting the battlements of the castle in a fit of insanity. She consented to take shelter in a miserable kitchen in the neighborhood, but at daylight returned to the castle walls, where she stood, immovable as a statue, till Isabella arrived and exerted her authority in removing her. In a few months she returned to Flanders, notwithstanding her mother's unwillingness to trust her to the journey during the inclement season, and while the country was agitated with warlike preparations to further the conquests of Gonzalvo de Cordova in Italy. Still inconsolable for the loss of her most cherished daughter, the amiable and beautiful Queen of Portugal, missing with a mother's yearning tenderness those who had been destined to a foreign land, and daily probed to the utmost depths of her tried heart with painful accounts of slander and disgraceful scenes enacted by the unhappy Joanna at the Flemish court, together with anxiety for the issue of the impending war, and letters from the New World exciting her active sympathies for the welfare of the poor Indians, all this drew too heavily upon her already exhausted constitution, and prostrated her in a bed of sickness from which she was never to rise. Her life was slowly consumed by a fever, not lessened by her solicitude for Ferdinand, who was seriously ill at the same time. She still, with surprising energy, attended to business, receiving all who sought an interview as she had been accustomed to do when in health, but particularly attending to affairs relating to the welfare of her subjects when she should no longer be with them. Among her last words were earnest injunctions to enforce kindness and justice towards the Indians whose condition had greatly excited her interest and pity. The continued violation of her early commands was concealed from her, and the suspicion of this induced her to make them the subject of a codicil to her will, two days before her death. Owing to the incapacity of Joanna to occupy the throne, she appointed Ferdinand regent of Castile, until the majority of her grandson, Charles V., influenced in so doing by her declared confidence in Ferdinand's wise and beneficent rule. 
she also touchingly expressed her affection for him in the words which bequeathed to him some of her personal property. I beseech the king, my lord, that he will accept all my jewels, or such as he shall select, so that, seeing them, he may be reminded of the singular love I always bore him while living, and that I am now waiting for him in a better world, by which remembrance he may be encouraged to live more justly and holy in this. The same jewels, perhaps, not long after, served to adorn a young, beautiful bride, the Princess Germaine de Foix of France, whom the unfaithful and politic Ferdinand led to the altar in the same duenas where, in his youth, he had given his fresh vows to the devoted Isabella. Having addressed a few words of consolation to the weeping friends about her, some of whom had been the companions of her youth, she received the sacrament and soon after expired, November 26, 1504, it being the fifty-fourth year of her age and the thirtieth of her reign. Her remains were conveyed to Granada, as she had requested, but during the journey a severe and long-continued tempest made the roads nearly impassable, rendering the way desolate, and depressing with still deeper gloom those who bore her beloved form to its plain tomb in the Alhambra. To that unfathomed boundless sea, the silent grave, thither all earthly pomp and boast roll, to be swallowed up and lost in one dark wave. The people vied with each other in extolling the triumphant glories of her reign and the wisdom and purity of her character, one that scarcely deserves the charge of bigotry, since the two great errors of her administration were measures which she abhorred and would never have allowed to be executed, had not her judgment been overruled by those upon whom she relied for spiritual guidance. Uniting the noblest masculine qualities with the finest and most lovable characteristics of woman, she secured the love and devotion of a nation still proud of that incomparable queen, upon whom was justly bestowed, then as now, the simple but eloquent designation, Isabella de la Paz y Bondad, Isabella of Peace and Goodness. End of Section 11